uh, spacing patterns. Uh, this is when it was set up. So the total surface area is 23.2 centimeters. So it's a real small little chunk of coral that was used to make this. This is uh, 38 days later, 125 days later, and 205 days later. So we see 178.3 centimeters. So if we plot that out, um, so we started in June. This is Praise Labata, by the way. Um, on this axis, we have total area cover, which is the red line. We go from um, about uh, one, this is, um, oh, total area cover. Okay, so we started at about 20 square centimeters, and we end up at about 180. So almost an order of magnitude increase in seven months. If we look at the total area covered, this should be centimeters, uh, square centimeters growth is what axis disappeared here. Um, we started at 0.7, oh, these are 95% confidence intervals. We started at 0.7 uh, centimeters, and we end up all the way up here at seven centimeters. So that is an order of magnitude growth. So this is pretty amazing. Um, we've also been working with different attachment methods for corals. Uh, this is probably one of the most important, if you really want to aquaculture corals, I think this is very important. Um, the one centimeter mesh, this is a plastic mesh, mesh material that's available at, at Home Depot. Uh, it's got a number of advantages. One is um, that you, it provides a, a point for measurement. It's easy, to, it's one centimeter square. Um, it also allows points of attachment for labels, which is a big issue uh, with growing corals. Um, it also, if it's somewhat flexible, so you can cram nubbins in there and they hold rather tightly. If you, you can cut the mesh and force in larger fragments and they grow within a matter of weeks. They grow tissue out on to the mesh. And potentially you could also use this mesh as uh, tether points or attachment points if you wanted to do experiments out in, in nature. So I, I really think that this is something that could be uh, very useful in the future, especially combined with maybe with the encrusting. Uh, you could make uh, uh, coral colonies, functional coral colonies rather quickly. So uh, coral culturing methods are rapidly, rapidly improving. Uh, so now what? What does that mean? Um, well, uh, an inland nursery is, we believe it's, it's starting to be feasible. And this has really positive implications for the coral trade and for research and could, we hope, direct, reduce the amount of take from nature. Um, as for restoration, we really need to do field experiments in order to see if, uh, if this really can work out. Uh, we had field experiments planned for this year, but we did not do them because we had uh, several concerns, and these were shared uh, uh, with the management committee and also with a, a number of state representatives. Uh, and uh, one of the main concerns is that transplanted coral could potentially serve as a, as a vector for disease and for invasive species. Um, so we had, have two possible approaches to this. One is to transplant as close as possible within uh, what we're calling, for lack of a better word, a transplantation zone, um, which would be a, a region of, so as, as small as possible within, let's say your, your concern is uh, invasive species within Kanaohe Bay. You might only want to transplant within a reef within Kanaohe Bay. And when you're transplanting, you want to do uh, inspection, removal, and quarantine. So it's whatever the, the transplantation zone has to do with whatever uh, the management issue is. You'd also want to have your culturing facility, if it's, not a, if it's an open system, you would also want to have it as close as possible to your transplantation site. Another concern is gen uh, genetically altering the coral landscape by having a lot of coral fragments that are the same genotype. Um, so one solution from this would be to take smaller fragments from more colonies. So when their uh, transplantation effort is underway, when they move corals, they break off small fragments. If you take those small fragments uh, from the transplanted corals and put them into an inland nursery and grow them up for a while. Another alternative, the best, the kind of the holy grail, is to rear corals from larvae. But this is something that is extraordinarily difficult. A number of groups are trying this, and it's not easy. Um, so for Hickory 9, we had proposed to investigate a suspended midwater nursery attachment methods and do another uh, controlled experiment looking at nutrient and water quality parameters. We have some potential new opportunities. Um, one is Cindy and I put in uh, an application for uh, uh, funding for an international workshop on uh, coral restoration methods, which uh, if it gets funded would take place in the summer? Not this summer, probably next summer. Next summer, okay. 
Um, we also have been introduced, Dave uh, Golko introduced us to Eric uh, Whiteman, who is able to make it today from Campbell High School, who's doing an uh, aquaculture uh, curriculum at Campbell High School. So uh, we thought this would be an excellent opportunity to do some public outreach and maybe even use this system. Uh, since it's a closed system, it might be an interesting uh, place to do follow-up experiments, especially uh, these variety of experiments. We have a potential opportunity to do uh, collaboration, more collaborations with the Richmond Lab looking at uh, larval settlement uh, to try and rear uh, coral from larva. Um, and there's also been a talk of a potential internship with U.S. Fish and Wildlife or with NOAA. So um, these are the undergraduate students that I've mentored during the past year, uh, talks, presentations, uh, papers, and posters. And with that, I'd like to thank Hickory, uh, Bob Richman, Mike Hadfield, uh, Charles Delbeck, Waikiki Aquarium, Dave Golko with uh, DAR. Also, uh, Nidira, Sonico, Lauren, Adam, William, Toby, and Carrie are all uh, graduate and undergraduate assistants who have helped me uh, out in the hot sun uh, fragmenting coral. So with that, thank you.